Hello and welcome back to the series of ranking Genshin characters on their Honkai Star Rail paths. Where we do an in-depth analysis on every playable Genshin characters from each region and collect the data of their character kits and playstyle to determine which of the 7 playable paths of the Aeons will they follow in Honkai Star Rail. And this time, the characters from the region we will be analyzing is... Drumroll please! Xianzhou Luofu. Wait a minute. Uh, I mean, Liyue. So, let's get to it, shall we? Alright, let's do a quick recap on the paths of the Aeons for some of you guys who don't play Honkai Star Rail. The Path of Destruction are strong single and multi-target DPS who are known for their self-sustainance. The Path of Erudition are multi-target DPS who works very well against groups of enemies. The Path of the Hun are fast and agile single-target DPS. The Path of Preservation are the protectors of the team with their unbreakable shield and huge damage reduction. The Path of Harmony are the buffers for the team. The Path of Nihility are debuffers and crowd controllers for the enemies. And finally, we have the Path of Abundance who are known to be the healers of the team. So, you got all that? Good. If not, skill issue. An L plus ratio. Also, hey, subscribe for more. All you need to do is click a button and turn on the bell. Easy, right? But first things first, patch notes. Why, you ask? Because it has come to my attention that I might have made a mistake or two during the last time analyzing Mondstadt characters. Feel free to click on this card if you haven't watched it. Now, with the help of the comments and corrections from some smart individuals, here are the new updates. Lisa is now a Nihildi character. It's true that on the release of Genshin Impact, Lisa was meant to be erudition. But now that Dendro exists, including the existence of overall better Electro units for damage, and following Akron's existence of being the pet of Nihilti despite the obvious destruction and erudition type of DPS in her kit, I came into a conclusion that being a more effective DPS specifically only on the buff enemies are one of Nihildi's aspect. And Lisa's biggest damage source being Violet Arc that needs to stack on enemies up to 3 times can be considered as a debuff. Next is Mona Magistus, and surprise surprise, she's now also a Nihilti character. What? Mona's no longer Harmony? Never was. Let me explain. So, according to this smart dude in the comments, Mona's bubble affects the enemies so they can take more damage. She does not directly buff our character stats to boost our damage. Unless, uh, you guys count Trailing Tales of Dragon Slayers. But overall, Mona's bubble works more like Silver Rope applying virus to the enemies, reducing their defense so they take more damage. Kaya is now a destruction unit. I mean, I kinda always thought Kaya is more on the destruction side, just wasn't fully sure about it. But Kaya heals every time he spams his skill. And the existence of Arlan being kinda a single target DPS until he has his ultimate ready adds in more about Kaya's potential. And finally, our favorite Chunibio Princess Endeavor Urtailum, Amy! Uh, I mean, Fischl. She now joins the Path of the Han because of Oz's similarity to Numbi. Also, despite her AoE, she really is more effective at dealing single target damage. Congratulations, you guys convinced me. Well, uh, I believe that's everything for the patch notes. Now let's go back to the real reason we're here. So, the first Liyue character we're gonna analyze is... Geo Traveler. Huh, were you expecting Shang Ling? You thought it was Shang Ling, but it was him, Geo Traveler. Ay, 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 ay. Geo Traveler's elemental skill Starfell Sword summons a meteorite. Well, at least that's what it says. This meteorite stays in the spot casted as a geo construct and can be used for climbing. 
It also deals AoE Geo damage to enemies when it hits. Geo Traveler's Elemental Burst Wake of Earth summons a wave of Geo Construct that is shaped like a circle, that also deals AoE Geo damage to the surrounding enemies. He has a passive talent called Shattered Dark Rock, which reduces the cooldown of Starfell Sword. Then we got Frenzied Rock Slide that makes Traveler's final hit of his combo of normal attacks deal Geo damage. Constellation 1 makes party members near the radius of Wake of Earth gains 10% extra crit rate. Constellation 2 makes the meteorite from Starfell Sword explode when it's destroyed, dealing AoE Geo damage. T4 regenerates Geo Traveler's energy for every enemy hit by Wake of Earth. And finally, we have C6 that prolongs the duration of Geo Traveler's construct. I believe according to the meta, Geo Traveler is most likely used as an off-field DPS support, or maybe as a crit rate booster for Constellation 1 or a buff. But overall, with Geo Traveler being both effective in single target and AoE damage, and considering how Crystallize works, it is possible for Geo Traveler to self-sustain. Therefore, I declare that Geo Traveler joins the path of destruction. Shangling. All right, now we actually get to Shang Ling. Shang Ling's elemental skill Gooba attack summons the Almighty Stove God to incinerate enemies. Yeah, that that's kind of it. And the elemental burst Pyronado is where Shang Ling shines brighter than any five stars in existence by summoning a flame tornado that turns everything in the surrounding to ashes. Crossfire increases the range of Gooba's flamethrower. Then we have Beware, it's super hot. Which makes Gooba drop the chili pepper when he disappears that boosts party members' attack if they pick it up. Constellation 1 decreases enemies' pyro resilience when hit by Gooba's attack. Constellation 2 makes Shang Ling's final combo of her normal attack yield some implode status to the enemies that can explode. Constellation 4 increases Pyronado's duration. And finally, Constellation 6 that boosts all party members' pyro damage bonus when Pyronado is active. I believe we know what path fits Shang Ling the most with that Pyronado of Doom. Welcome to the Air Edition, Gang Shangling. It's no Xingqiu. Xingqiu's elemental skill Guhua Sword Fatal Rain Screen allows Xingqiu to perform twin strikes with his sword dealing hydro damage. After doing that, your party members will be surrounded by a couple rain swords that reduces incoming damage. Xingqiu's Elemental Burst Guhua Sword Rain Cutter summons back the Rain Swords, but this time enhancing it, dealing follow-up Rain Swords attack when your party members perform a normal attack. And then we have Hydropatic as a passive talent, which heals your characters based on Xingqiu's max HP when his Rain Swords disappear or expire. Then we have Blades Emits Raindrops that increases Xingqiu's overall Hydro damage. Constellation 1 increases the maximum number of Rain Swords by 1. It's supposed to be 3, but there's four. Constellation 2 increases the duration of Rain Cutter and also decreases opponent's cyber resilience when they are hit by Rain Swords. Constellation 4 increases the damage of Fatal Rain Screen when Rain Cutter is active. And Constellation 6 enhances Rain Cutter and also the third sword of the Rain Attacks it does, while also at the same time regenerating Xingqiu's energy a little. So, the question is, what path does Xingqiu follow? You see, the thing about the uniqueness of Xingqiu's kit makes it hard to decide. Like for example, Fatal Rain Screen is capable of hitting multi-targets, but I believe it's a lot more effective at dealing single target damage. Then we have the damage reduction from each of his Rain Swords, plus the healing from the Hydropatic passive. If we only trace those feats to Xingqiu himself, those will be the aspects of the Path of Destruction. But instead, the Rain Swords kinda works on other party members, which makes the damage reduction somewhat of a preservation aspect. So I can't really put Xingqiu in the Path of Destruction because his sustenance is actually shared with others. He can't join the Path of Harmony or Preservation too because he's not directly buffing other party members' stats and also his damage reduction is very low. I also believe that his follow-up Rain Swords attacks are more effective at hitting one target at a time, which leaves us to the only possible path, the Hunt. <laughs> Chong Yun's elemental skill Spirit Blade Chong Hua Slayered Frost summons an AoE Ice Field that converts normal attacks to cryo damage for Sword, Pole Arm, and Claymore users. The passive talent Steady Breeding allows those weapon class to have their normal attack speed increase in Chong Hua's Layer Frost. The second passive talent, Rhyme Chaser Blade, summons a blade to strike nearby opponents when the Chong Hua Layered Frost expires. 
also decreasing their cryo resilience. Chongyun's Elemental Burst Spirit Blade Cloud Parting Star summons three giant ice blades at the enemies. Constellation 1 makes it so that the final hit of Chongyun's normal attacks unleash AoE ice blades to the surroundings. Constellation 2 reduces Elemental Burst and Elemental Skill cooldown when they are in the Chonghua Layer Frost. Constellation 4 regenerates Chongyun's energy every time he hits an opponent affected by Cryo. Okay, I believe I owe you guys a little bit of an explanation of what pad this is. So for some reason, according to the simulated universe, the Pad of Remembrance are the pad that resonates the most with Ice, which in Genshin's case would be the element of Cryo. So if it means to get buffs from your characters or maybe debuffs to your enemies, as long as if it's Ice or Frozen related, that will be an aspect for the Pad of Remembrance. And finally, we have C6 that boosts Chongyun's elemental burst damage against enemies with lower max HP percentage than Chongyun. Also, the giant ice blades is increased from 3 to 4. Now, I believe according to the meta, Chongyun is most likely used as an off-field cry applicator support. Or maybe straight up not used at all. But I guess the meta kinda use him more like a harmony character for the support. But just out of respect, I'll let Chong Yun join in the Annihilation Gang. Sidnyan. To be brutally honest, I don't even think Sidnyan has a use. She does make a shield. But let's be real, there are clearly better shielder choices. Her burst doesn't even do much and it can literally just miss. And a very simple elemental burst just like that has 60 energy costs. Keijing's burst is also small in AoE but it can literally hit enemies. And all that for only 40 energy costs. Sinyan is so useless, even the torch of this game is way better than her. Wait a minute, Amber is a Mondstadt character. And we are done with Mondstadt's part. Uh, Moving on, despite all of that, Sinyan technically kinda have a use. With enough constellations, Sinyan can be played as a Han character by turning her into a physical DPS. Of course, this only works if you have her at high constellation. But no constellations, no nothing? This woman is useless! But then again, she does make a shield. Well, best I can give is preservation. Beidou so, for Beidou's part, I got myself a guest who claims he is Beidou's number one husband. And in order to test that theory, I got him to do Beidou's part. Hi, I'm Navy, professor scratcher, Hoyaverse meat writer, but most importantly, a family-friendly content creator. Yeah, sure you are, little bro. Oh, Hmm, sounds like a cheater to me. Now, Strangely has Strangely asked me to do the Beidou part for him, so I happily obliged. Look, if there's anything that you should know about me is that I identify myself as Beidou's legal husband, and anyone who dares try to disagree with me on that, haha, <sighs> I have irrefutable evidence, you know? Alright, Beidou is a fun and versatile character that can be slotted into any Electro team that you can think of. And before you all say, hey, isn't she just official but worse? In my defense, your honor, I think you should f go. Okay, okay. Time to actually analyze her tit. I, I mean kit. When pressing Beidou's elemental skill, it will create a small AoE damage to surrounding enemies. However, it also allows you to parry enemies by creating a damage absorbing shield while simultaneously dealing massive AoE and increased damage just by holding it. So not only does it deal great AoE damage, but also has amazing survival capabilities, since it allows you to absorb damage, as you can see right here. So, destruction. Now, when activating her burst, it achieves two things. A, when a character does a normal or charge attack, it will do single target electro damage, and if there are more enemies close by, then the damage will bounce between the targets two more times. And B, it reduces damage received and also increases interruption resistance. And yep, same thing, both AoE damage and survival capabilities checked. So, destruction. And strangely, Beidou spurts can target up to three enemies. And you know who also can target up to three enemies? Basically every destruction character. 
Its first passive decreases stamina consumption when swimming by 20%. Normally, I would put this at harmony, but strangely said, nah, I'd hunt. So, hunt, I guess. Okay, so the reason I call this the hunt is because it's not exactly a buff passive talent. All it does is just reduce stamina for more mobility, so yeah. Her A1 passive allows her to deal significant AoE damage, so long as you don't have a skill issue. Her A4 passive, after you pair it with Beidou, it allows her to essentially just attack faster and deal higher single target damage. Now for constellations. C1. Summons a shield after casting her burst that scales off of her max HP. Preservation. Need I say more? C2. Remember what I said earlier about her burst? Well, scratch that, cause instead of bouncing between targets 2 additional times, you can now bounce between targets 4 additional times, effectively triggering 5 instances of damage when you do normal or charge attacks. And you know who also deals damage to 5 enemies maximum? Basically every single erudition character. C4. Just gives a teeny tiny little bit more single target damage when attacked. Destruction. C6. After casting her burst, her surrounding characters receive an electro resistance debuff by 15%. Surprisingly, Nihility. Alright, now that we've seen it all, ranging from her constellations to a kit to a tit, where does Beidou fare in the Honkai Star Rail paths? Now, if we just compress everything together, just like how she compresses me during set, her whole kit just screams dealing decent AoE damage and survival capabilities. So, destruction. And hey, it's also really fitting, because every time we're in bed, she always destructs my pee. Alternatively, you can play her as a preservation character. Said no one ever, because why in the ever-living- Alright Navy, I think I have tolerated enough of your swearing. This is a family-friendly Minecraft server, you know? So maybe instead of locking you up in a basement with 69 hoot towels, why don't we make it 420 hoot towels, hmm? And we both know very well that you wouldn't like this idea, would you? So, I believe we have an understanding, yeah? Also, I know this really isn't my business, but I believe you'll have to answer to your so-called wife Beidou because of- But anyway, destruction. Ningguang. So, I thought of asking Gratis status to do Ning Wong's part. And the reason for that is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, maybe he's not the best character, but... <gasps> <gasps> yeah. But I guess that's not exactly gonna work because of our massive number difference. And, well, he's kinda dead. Just like me, for real. But anyway, Ningguang's elemental skill Jade Screen summons a Jade Screen that deals AoE Geo damage. Her elemental burst Star Shatter scatters Geo projectiles at the enemies that can hit multiple targets. But using Star Shatter when a Jade Screen is present will cause the Jade Screen to shoot extra Geo projectiles at the enemies. The passive talent backup plan makes Ningguang's charge attack not consume any stamina as long as she possesses Star Jades. What are Star Jades you ask? You see this spinning rock aura thing around her? Yep, that's it. Anyway, no Star Jades? And Star Jades. Simple, right? Now we got Strategic Reserve. Characters that passes through Ningguang's Jade Screen will gain an extra Geo Damage bonus. Constellation 1 makes Ningguang's normal attacks deal AoE damage. Constellation 2 allows Ningguang to create another Jade Screen immediately if the current one is broken. C4 allows Jade Screen to increase nearby party members' elemental resilience. And finally, we got C6 that allows Ningguang to get a cooler version of the Star Jades every time she uses is her burst. Now I don't know about you guys, but I think it's clear what Pan Ningguang follows from the AoEs in her kit. Plus one erudition character. Keyching. Now this time, instead of having a self-proclaimed simp like this child here, I managed to get my hands on an old friend who's actually the number one Keyching enjoyer in the entire multiverse. With, let's say, more authentic evidence. 
I present to you the guy with the Stockholm Syndrome. That's what he said. The amazing Vortex Zero. Oh, hello. <laughs> my name is Vortex. I am going to be talking about my favorite Genshin character, Kuching. So, in terms of Kuching's kit, her first ability that you probably want to think of is her E skill. Now, when you tap E, it'll throw her stiletto towards the enemy character in a rapid fashion, like when you go to smack your homies. Your homies, when you tap it, it just throws it out there. When you hold the skill, it actually lets you aim the skill and let you do some interesting tech like flying up in the air, doing plunge strikes, and whatnot. Now, what this does is the actual stiletto itself applies electro to whatever target you hit with it. And then once you tap it again, it will actually uh, allow you to teleport to where that stiletto is. So essentially you're going from point A to point B by pressing E or pressing and holding and choosing where you want to go relatively in front of you. Also, when you use Kuching's E skill, her normal attacks will be applied with electro damage. So this also applies electro when she's going bam, 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 as you can see here. <laughs> Which is thundering penance, they will apply electro to her build more or less. In terms of her Q skill, her Q skill is generally referred to as jumping to the enemy and doing a AoE burst of Electro where she teleports around and does the thing as you can see on the screen. Eh? Strangely, wrong clip, that's Sila. Oops, my bad. You mean this? Oh, sorry, I meant this one. Uh, we'll get there. Let me just... Uh, pretty sure it was that one. Hold up for a second. Ah, there it is. Anyway, so this allows her to apply a small AoE area of electro damage and burst damage. Kuching also gets another great passive talent when she reaches level 70 with her Ascension rank 4. She gets a really awesome buff to her Q skill, which will allow her to get even more crit rate and even more energy recharge, which allows her to basically put more electro down range and more damage, more crit rate, until the enemy is dead. You get some crit rate, you get some crit rate, you get some crit rate, everybody gets some crit rate and energy recharge. Let's go. And let's not forget, she has a phenomenal passive that speeds up all of your dispatch times to be able to get your materials there faster because she's not going to let you procrastinate on the job. Now when we move on to her constellations, in terms of her C1, if she recasts her stiletto and it's still on the field, it will deal additional electro damage. So electro damage on electro damage, this is a repeating train that's going to absolutely run over any enemy in the way and that she's totally not trying to kill me because I haven't spent time with her for the past three months because I've been MIA. Okay, she's not here. She's fine. Her second constellation, every time Kuching hits an opponent affected by Electro, there's a good chance she'll receive a elemental orb, which actually gives her more energy and be able to continuously um, perpetuate the train of destruction that is Kuching's Electro damage. C4 increases Kuching's attack by 25% after she triggers Electro reaction, so overload, superconduct, taser, gravity aggravate you know the typical like reactions with electro and not anything to do with uh, geo of course <laughs> and uh, c6 I, I don't know what that would be you know i mean honestly i don't even have c6 i mean i haven't i have only gotten like uh, a few copies of her it's fine <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fooling anyone. C6 boosts C 
Kutching's electro damage by 6% every time she uses her normal charge attacks or skills and bursts. And the effects are independent, which means you can get a 24% extra electro damage. I think that's what it does. I certainly don't have C6. No, 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 no. It, it certainly, no, no, of course, I wouldn't know anything about that. So by compiling our data and analysis, pitching, more or less in my opinion, leans towards the hunt in terms of her damage because she only mainly focuses on single target damage. It could be applied to her Q skill as well because technically it's a small enough range that it can only hit one enemy at a time depending on how spread out the enemies are. You'd really need to group the enemies together to do that and it doesn't really apply to turn-based combat or how many targets it hits there because open world combat doesn't necessarily translate well to a turn-based setting. But... Strangely, why is there a destruction symbol there? She's not destruction. She's not AoE. Every character doesn't have to be destruction just because you want all the mommy characters to destroy you. Oh, I see. I see you. I see you, strangely. Quit that. Um, both you and I are completely single. Uh, yes, sir. I get it. But don't do that. Okay. So after checking the script, making sure there's nothing left for me to talk about, I need to keep moving because Cushing is probably going to come after me and she's probably right behind me. Me, yes, I know! By the way, I'll be streaming soon, and I'll be debuting soon, and this model will be updated. Twitch TV slash Vortex Zero underscore, or something like that. You'll find me if you look for me. <laughs> Links in description. No. Huge thanks to the amazing Vortex Zero for presenting us Keychings part. You see, Vortex here has faced challenges while doing this, which ends up with me editing his part. But he still makes his time and delivers the requirements needed to make this happen. Truly the best and most dedicated catching main ever. So I will be putting a card on top of the screen right here for you guys to check him out and make sure to show him some love. Yangu. I mean, Ganyu. <laughs> Ganyu's charge aim shot from Liutian Archery has two different levels. Charge level 1 being an ordinary cryo arrow, and level 2 which is a fully charged aim shot that shoots a frost flake arrow, capable of dealing AoE cryo damage once it blooms. Ganyu's elemental skill Trail of the Chillin allows Ganyu to dash backward summoning an Ice Lotus while dealing cryo damage. This Ice Lotus will continuously taunt the enemies to attack it and will deal cryo damage when it's destroyed or expires. Ganyu's elemental burst Celestial Shower will rain down ice shards on a big AoE field that deals cryo damage to the surrounding enemies. I'd like to explain further, but since it's a little too obvious on how much AoE Ganyu is able to cover from her charge aim shot and celestial shower, I don't think that's necessary anymore. So, Ganyu follows the path of erudition. Yelan Now for Yelan's part, let's just say I brought someone who claims to be the number one Yilan in the entire multiverse. And I must say, this guy really have some convincing evidence. So let's see if that evidence can keep up with his analysis. I present to you guys, Yilan Slave Tao. All right, enough of this disgusting mobile gameplay in the background, bro. It's time for some real high quality Genshin content from the number one Yalan worshipper of all time and eternity if you hadn't known before. The homie strangely asked me to do the Yalan section part of this tier list because he's smart enough to know that I am the only man in the world that can talk about Yalan, my precious spy queen, my beautiful candy hater. So let's get this over with as quick as possible. I'm still in the middle of my afternoon date with Yalan. So starting off with Yalan's skill, Lingering Lifeline. Fires off a lifeline that allows her to move rapidly, marking opponents along its path, and dealing hydro damage once it ends. Obviously, huge multi-target damage with this skill, and it's what Yolan is best known for. 
Yolan's ultimate, Death Clarion Dice, summons an exquisite throw, which will initiate a coordinated attack of hydro damage towards the nearest enemy, based on Yolan's max HP. It can also basically reset its flurry of attacks every time you use a normal attack or each time Yolan's lifeline explodes and hits opponents. Yolan's second passive allows your active party member to perform 1% more damage with exquisite throw and increases damage dealt by a further 3.5% every second. Now the thing about Yolan's ult is that the Death Clarion Dice is actually Actually the part of the ultimate that does the AOE damage, but the exquisite throw that comes afterwards does single target damage. So it's kind of a mix between the two, but exquisite throw deals more damage than a death clarion dice does. So I give this ultimate the hunt path. Yolan's first and third passives aren't very important, but if I had to give them both a path, it would most likely be the path of harmony. Wait a minute, can we rewind that? <laughs> Of harmony. As Yolan's HP increases based on the party's elemental types for the first passive. Whoa, whoa, slow down there, Tao. It increases Yolan's max HP. It doesn't increase the party member's max HP. Therefore, it only buffs Yolan herself, which is technically the path of destruction instead of harmony. You just made a mistake. Now, that is pretty odd, don't you think? And the third passive allows Yolan to gain 25% more rewards when expeditioning. Now onto Yolan's most important constellations. Yolan C2 allows Exquisite Throw to fire an additional water arrow based on Yolan's HP. Yolan C4 increases all party members' max HP by 10% for 25 seconds for every opponent marked by lifeline when the lifeline explodes. Now at first, I thought this was abundance, but this is not actually healing your party members. It's just stacking the HP they already have. So in case of characters like Hu Tao and even Well herself, this is a huge buff because it gives Hu Tao more HP to do more damage, but doesn't heal her from her low health. Huh, so you do understand the concept of harmony. Wouldn't that just make things even weirder? And finally, Yolan C6 turns her into the best minigun in the entire game. Extreme single target damage for this one. So I'm gonna have to go with the hunt for this one. So, what should Yolan's path be? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. It's clearly the path of beauty because Yolan is truly the most gorgeous, voluptuous, stylish, and glamorous woman in all of- But in all seriousness, it's kind of a throw between the hunt and erudition. Now, according to my calculations, the hunt plus erudition is equivalent to destruction, I believe. But I'm just gonna give her the path of erudition simply- Okay. Simply because her skill is famous for high multi-target damage coverage. And she's literally a spy who works for Ning Guang. She's all about logic and strategic behavior in which, strangely, you know fully well, you should also be taking the, uh, character's personalities into consideration. You know it, you just don't want to admit it. Well, sorry to break your bubbles, Tao, but that's not gonna work. You see, some of these pet personalities, as you may say, isn't exactly accurate for certain characters. Because the best character in the game, Mr. Weldyang, the harsher of reason who has saved the planet from annihilation from time to time, happens to join the pet of nihility. But this man right here is clearly the opposite of people who believes in meaningless behavior. But Chu, in the other hand, the number one best Yelan main in the entire multiverse, made a mistake in classifying her passive talent path and that is not everything, Tao. Your analysis here is missing one crucial detail about Yelan. That's right, you didn't even once mention the special charge aim shot that Yelan possess. A true Yelan main would know that even a mere charge aim shot is crucial to Yelan's playstyle. Which makes me question, are you really the number one Yelan slave in the entire multiverse who you claim to be? Breaking to that news! Ladies and gentle travelers, some hot and steamy news just came in. We recently found out that a YouTuber named Tao, the self-proclaimed biggest Yelan sim in the whole multiverse, made a big oopsie. He allegedly forgot to even mention the charge aim shot of Yelan, which is pretty important to her kid. Any respectable Yelan main should know that you have to use her charge aim shot while waiting for her hydro particles to come back. And even more so, he gave her passive skill the harmony pass, even though it only buffs herself. I, I mean, I'm no Hawkeye style expert, but that's gotta be more lined up for destruction, am I right? Can you believe it? What the freaking ding- Wait, what? That wasn't part of the script Strange they gave me? Oh, uh huh. Ahem. <clears throat> Anyway, is Tao truly the biggest Yelan sim, or is he actually a fraud the whole time? Find out in the next episode of Breaking Tibet News! Zhang Li
It's finally time for the Archon Analysis. Now, if you've known me for a while, then you'll notice how much I love Zhongli. And I'm on the road to C6 him without spending a single dime. You see, I have been saving a total of around 300 pulls so far, and it would have been a lot more than that if I didn't get well, Kazuha Yula Nahida Chichi, C2 by the way, Godzilla Darth Vader, and the most recent case is... Fenari. Also, I guess I know who to blame now for my C3 keychain. Anyway, Zhongli's elemental skill, Dominus Lapidus, has a tap version and a hold version. The tap version allows Zhongli to summon a Geo Pillar that can deal AoE Geo attacks. While the hold version deals AoE Geo damage, summoning a pillar, and also creating the iconic Nokia Jade Shield that everybody respects. Now Zhongli's pillar here is capable to resonate with nearby Geo constructs, which will further increase the AoE of its Geo attacks. And this also surprisingly works with enemies' Geo constructs. Now onto his Jade Shield. The Jade Shield has 150% damage absorption and also 20% resilience reduction to the surrounding enemies. The shield also stays on for quite some time that it even has 100% uptime. Pair this with a passive talent resonant waves and you can get up to 25% extra shield strength each time the shield takes damage. And now we have what Zhongli is mainly known for. Planet Default. Summons a giant meteor that probably was the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, dealing massive AoE Geo damage. And if you somehow survive the meteor, you're petrified, unable to move or scream, waiting for your impending doom. Anyway, Dominance of Earth increases Zhongli's normal attack, skill, and burst damage based on his max HP. Constellation 1 allows Zhongli to summon an extra pillar, making it 2 pillars maximum. C2 gives everyone a Jade Shield every time Zhongli tries to wipe out dinosaurs, and this even works on co-op mode. And C4 increases Zhongli's Meteor's AoE and Petrification duration. And finally, C6. He will be C6. We are just playing the waiting game for now. Every time Zhongli's Jade Shield takes damage, that damage will be converted into HP, making you casually forget healers exist. So, what path does Zhongli follow? Preservation. I mean, did you see the guy? Aventurine is literally him. But, Physical Zhongli can join the hunt for support, is Irritation, may be inhaled with a Petrification, or if you're a C6 Menace with healing artifacts, Abundance. But overall, our favorite Geo Argon is gonna be joining the Path of Preservation. Xiao. Alright everyone, for Xiao's part, we have a very special guest coming to analyze him. The number one Xiao in the entire multiverse. The guy who would go so far just to defend Xiao's height. I present to you guys, the one and only, Zayas! Uh, Zyox? Mr. Sox? Zionix? Huh, that's odd. Hold on one second. Hi, strange human this. Yo, Pusu. Ni hao. Oh, I see. Hi, wakarimashita. Well, okay, guys, hear me out. So the plan was indeed to get Zyox in here for Xiao's part. And trust me, I actually tried that. I actually went into his server to ask the mods there for permission for this collab. And, uh, I even sent him an email. This is obviously a massive gamble. You've probably seen the guy. But me? Yeah, I'm just a bacterium compared to him. And an admin in there called Sir Aslan Marco Polo told me that it's not going to happen. So, here we are. Oh, well... Nick, if you're watching somehow, this is for you. And whatever that will be shown next, I got Alan's permission.
無能消えろ無能Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to my complete and detailed Xiao analysis. If he theoretically has a Honkai Star L patch, so Xiao has been existing in Genshin Impact ever since the early Liyue patch, making him one of the oldest OG character. And today, we're gonna analyze Xiao's combat talents and character kits, including his playstyle, to determine which patch in Honkai Star L that will be fitting him the most. Before I begin, I do want to tell you guys that I do not stream on Twitch, the link is not in the description because I'm not Zyox. So with that being said, let's talk about the number one character in the entire game. Alright, so starting things off, what does Xiao actually do? Xiao's elemental skill allows Xiao to dash into the desired location, dealing a lot of animal damage to enemies on his way with a maximum of two times. The skill is also capable of hitting multiple targets lined up in the dashing area, but it's overall more effective at striking single targets. Xiao's elemental skill can also be used while you're jumping gliding in the air and also when you are falling to disperse fall damage, making this skill very useful for mobility and exploration. Xiao can also gradually increase his elemental skill damage by 15%, and this effect lasts for 7 seconds and has a maximum of 3 stacks. Also note that every time you gain a new stack, it refreshes the effect's duration. And of course, this thing only works if you have Xiao's second ascension passive. Now Xiao's elemental burst allows Xiao to don the Asha mask, greatly increasing his jumping capability and converts his normal, charge and plunge attacks into an ammo while also boosting his overall damage. At this stage, Xiao's elemental skill will no longer produce elemental orbs for himself and he will slowly drain his own HP. Due to his enhanced jumping capability, Xiao is now capable of doing extremely powerful plunge attacks that is very effective against both single and multi-target. His elemental burst lasts for quite some time before expiring but can also be removed immediately once Xiao is swapped out or knocked out. Also, his first ascension passive allows Xiao to increase his damage over time by 5%, up to a maximum of 25% if he's using his burst. Alright, moving on, let's now talk about Xiao's constellations. His C1 adds an extra charge to his elemental skill, making him capable of spamming it in a new maximum of 3 times in a row. C2 increases his energy recharge when he's off field, which is not exactly the best because he will often be on field most of the time. Xiao C4 increases his defense by 100% if his HP drops below 50%. Honestly, this is the worst constellation a character could have and I have no idea why this is on Xiao, cause it can clearly be way better than this but it's quite literally the opposite. For C6, it allows Xiao to spam his skill every time he plunges to at least two enemies while also ignoring the skill cooldown. So overall, I think Xiao has a very destruction playstyle including his combat talents and character kit with an added bonus of being able to perform agile mobility moves using his skill and also high jump, just like the Han characters. But in the end, with his HP drain and his capabilities in dealing single and multi-target damage, Xiao clearly follows the path of destruction. Who? Tao. Yeah. Hu Tao's elemental skill, Guide to Afterlife, will sacrifice a portion of Hu Tao's own HP and enters the Paramito Papilio state. At this state, Hu Tao's attack is gonna greatly increase based on her max HP. Also, she gains Pyro Infusion for normal attacks, charge attacks, and also plunge attacks. The Paramito Papilio state also allows Hu Tao to mark the enemy with Blood Blossom every time she uses her charge attack. The Blood Blossoms stay on the enemy for a while before dealing a burst of Pyro damage on expiry. The passive talent Flutterby will boost all party members' crit rate, excluding Hu Tao herself, when her Paramito Papilio state ends. Hu Tao's Elemental Burst Spirit Suitor will summon Hu Tao's Goofy A Companion to deal AoE Pyro damage to the surrounding enemies. Oh, and she heals too. Using this burst when Hu Tao's low HP, and also during Paramito Papilio state, will create the infamous Hu Tao Nuke that deals massive Pyro damage. Hu Tao's second ascension passive talent, Sanguine Rooch, will greatly boost Hu Tao's own pyro damage if her HP is equal to 50% or lower than 50%. Her first constellation allows Hu Tao to not use any stamina during her charge attacks in her Paramito Papilio state. Constellation 2 increases Blood Blossom damage by 10% of Hu Tao's max HP, and Spirit Suture will also apply Blood Blossom to enemies. Constellation 4 is pretty much just a Flutterby passive, but fancier giving all the party members crit rate boost, excluding Hu Tao herself, every time she defeats an enemy affected by Blood Blossom. 
And finally, we have C6 that does a lot of things. If Huta's HP drops below 25%, or if she's about to die, she will cheat dead itself and gain 100% crit rate, with an added bonus of 200% resilience against every damage that will last for some period of time. And in this state, all of her damage will be guaranteed critical hits no matter what. With that being said, what path does Hu Tao follow? Okay, so here's the thing. Hu Tao is very good at dealing single target damage. She's even equipped with a special mobility sprint that allows her to make swift movements and even escape traps. Now because of these reasons, I once thought that Hu Tao joins the path of the hunt. But sacrificing HP to boost attack and also capable of regaining them back without a healer. Not to mention how Hu Tao gets massively stronger when low HP. Yeah, she... She's a destruction character. Besides, Hook exists, and she does single target damage 90% of the time. Special thanks to Chris and Snirky for a minute to provide me with their Hu Tao consolation clips. Tartaglia. Okay, so technically here, Tartaglia is not really a Liyue character. He's more of a Shneshnaya character. So for that reason, instead of restricting Tartaglia's video shoot to only Liyue, we're gonna allow some of his clips to be filmed at Dragonspine, because that's the closest thing we got to Shneshnaya. Tartaglia's charge aim shot allows him to apply Riptide to an enemy. Enemies affected by Riptide will be marked and will take Hydra damage over time. This will occur every time Tartaglia hits an enemy with his charge aim shot. Tartaglia's elemental skill Full Legacy Raging Tide allows Tartaglia to go to his melee stance, now wielding dual Hydra Blades to deal Hydro damage, and also marking enemies with Riptide. Type. And tapping this skill again will bring Tartaglia back into his bow stance. And for some reason I can't explain, Tartaglia is unable to perform his plunge attacks in this state. He can do it just fine without his skill though. Tartaglia's elemental burst Havoc Obliteration can be triggered in his bow stance and melee stance. They both deal massive AoE Hydra damage and will be enhanced if the enemies are affected by Riptide. Again, I would like to explain further, but Tartaglia being the only character that can freely swap from range to melee, and is clearly good at dealing both single target and AoE damage, I don't think that even matters anymore. But here comes the tricky part. Tartaglia can be classified as a destruction character with his range and melee capabilities, but his Riptide is technically a debuff and it deals damage over time. But if I were to pick, I think the Path of Destruction fits him more. So Tartaglia joins the Destruction Gang. He can be an Hildi though. Saul Goodman Saul Goodman's elemental skill Sign Edict summons a blistering flame that deals AoE pyro damage. Targets hit by this skill will give Saul the maximum amount of Scarlet Seals. What are Scarlet Seals, you ask? The red sigils that appears behind Saul every time a normal attack hits an enemy. It has a maximum of 3 stacks, and the more Scarlet Seals, the stronger Saul's charge attack is. And as you guys can see here, no Scarlet Seals means weaker charge attacks. The Elemental Burst Stun deal deals AoE Pyro damage and bringing Saul Goodman to the Brilliant State. In this state, Saul will continuously gain Scarlet Seals over time, making the charge attacks even more spammable. The passive talent Proviso will convert all Scarlet Seals consumed by charge attacks into Pyro damage bonus. Then we have Blazing Eye that will deal follow-up AoE Pyro damage every time Saul Goodman's charge attacks crits. C1 reduces the charge attack stamina cost the more Scarlet Seals Saul have. For comparison, this is without the Scarlet Seals. C2 increases charge attack crit rate against enemies below 50% HP. If you have C4, every time Saul Goodman uses the Elemental Burst, a shield will appear to absorb damage. This is a Pyro Shield, so it absorbs Pyro damage better. Finally, C6, and you guys might have already noticed, the maximum number of Scarlet Seals is increased from 3 to 4. So what path does Saul Goodman follow? Well, this person here relies on charge attacks and Scarlet Seals, which is mostly AoE. That would make Saul Goodman an erudition character, unless you're one of those menaces of society. Preservation. But anyway, if you need someone who follows the path of erudition who's also a lawyer at the same time, better call Saul. Chi Chi 
She is abundant, her skill can heal you, her birth heals you too. C1 regents her energy, C2 buffs her damage, C4 debuffs the enemy. C6, she will pressure your party members. Baizu Baizu's elemental skill Universal Diagnosis summons a Gossamer Sprite that performs 3 attacks to the enemies before returning back and healing all party members HP. If there are no enemies in the way, the skill will just fly around for a while and then returning back and healing all the party members HP. Baizu's elemental burst Revivification Okay, I have no idea how to pronounce this. Revivification Revivification <laughs> Anyway, Baizu's Elemental Burst creates a shield that will continuously heal allies. This shield will also refresh itself every 2.5 seconds until it expires. This shield scales based on Baizu's max HP, and it can take hits especially from Dendro damage. Oh, and it shoots projectiles, as you can see here. So Baizu's path seems pretty obvious. He does have a shield, which makes him unique, but this shield continuously heals. Also, Baizu has a doctor title. Who else is a doctor? Natasha. Conclusion? Baizu is an abundance character. But if your shield is exceptionally strong, you can freely use him as a preservation character. Yao Yao. Okay, so why don't you guys take a look at this and you tell me what patch he follows. That's right, folks! She's clearly a destruction character and a follower of Nanook. <laughs> Yunjin Yunjin's elemental skill Opening Flourish has a tap version and a hold version. Tapping it will deal AoE Geo damage to the surrounding enemies. Holding it, however, will charge the skill for some time, creating a temporary shield that can absorb damage before releasing it and dealing AoE Geo damage. Her elemental burst Cliffbreaker's Banner will put all the party members in a Flying Cloud Flag Formation state. This state buffs all the party members' normal attack damage based on Yunjin's max defense. Okay, so Yunjin being one of the only few characters that can buff normal attack damage, that kind of makes her pad a little too obvious, isn't it? Unless, of course, you're, uh, one of these guys. Seriously, don't build Yunjin as a destruction or a Han character. Shenhe Shenhe's elemental skill Spring Spirit Summoning has a tap version and a hold version. The tap version will allow her to dash forward dealing cryo damage to the enemies in the way. The hold version will summon Shenhe's stand and will deal AoE cryo damage instead. Using Shenhe's elemental skill will allow all the party members to get the Icy Quill effect. And what it does is specifically buff cryo damage based on Shenhe's max attack. Meanwhile, Shenhe's Elemental Burst Divine Maiden's Deliverance creates an AoE field that will continuously deal cryo damage while also reducing enemies' cryo and physical resilience in the field. So Shenhe is the only character in the game that is specifically used to buff cryo damage. And she does a really good job on doing so. Her Elemental Burst is technically a debuff though, but I think she buffs the party members more than debuffing the enemies. Making Shenhe join the Path of Harmony. Shenyun. 
Xian Yun's elemental skill White Clouds at Dawn allows Xian Yun to enter the cloud transmogrification state, making her capable to leap in the sky up to 3 times before doing a special plunge attack dealing AoE enemy damage. Her elemental burst Star Scatter at Dusk will deal AoE enemy damage and summons the Star Wicker mechanism. After that, Xian Yun will continuously heal all the party members based on her attack scaling. Meanwhile, the Star Wicker mechanism will give all party members the high jump ability, allowing them access to continuous plunge attacks. Okay, so Xian Yun is kinda like the only character in the game that allows party members to freely plunge and high jump, which really shows her harmony side. But here's where it gets interesting. Xian Yun is surprisingly a solid healer. Conclusion, Xian Yun follows both the Path of Harmony and the Path of Abundance. But if I were to choose from those two, following Huo Huo's logic being the Path of Abundance, Xian Yun too will join the Path of Abundance. Gaming <sighs> Um, actually, it's pronounced as Jiaming, you uncultured swine. What the hell you say? Everybody, come look look, it's the pronunciation police! This pronunciation grammar police thing is so much holler, not wearing shirt! What the hell are you even trying to flex, huh? Your muscles, bro don't even have nipples! Look at his school VR hat, take that off and what are you? What the <laughs> That hair so messy, it make Franklin look like Kaya. You should go visit a barber, leh? Oh wait, you negative pura. Maybe you should go out there, be a street performer to get money, leh? I'll show everyone your number one song. I are a Latino lover, I stand dying queen. Hope she could stand on me just like the floor. Okay, I get it. You know, we can agree to disagree, right? Gaming kind of also has this nice tone to it, you know. It, it's fine, it's fine. That's what I thought. Anyway, since Jiaming is our final character, we're gonna speedrun this. Ha! I told you my pronunciation was correct! RR, let King know that I is greatest dumb machine. I beg, mommy, please do it harder. Anyway, as I was saying, Elemental Skill, HP Sacrifice, Self Regeneration, Destruction. Elemental Burst, Continuous Self Sustenance, and Spammable Plunge Attacks. Also, Destruction. Which makes Jiaming a Destruction character. And that concludes ranking all Liyue characters based on their Honkai Star L paths. Here's the complete tier list, and surprisingly, there is no Nihilti character. Except Tertaglia can technically be one. I would like to thank everyone that helped making this video possible. The creators who's willing to collab, and those who made their time to record their gameplay to be used as clips. I probably could not have done this without you guys, so really, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Just like before, if you're interested in trying the tier list, it is linked in the description below and also the pinned comment. Obviously, I plan to make more of this analysis for each region in Teyvat, so if you don't want to miss out, subscribe for more. Even though it's probably gonna take like forever. If you made it till the end, congratulations. Now if you haven't already, check out a prequel to this video where I analyze Mondstadt characters instead. All you gotta do is just click right here or the card above. You might wanna hurry up and click it before the video ends. I'll see you guys in that video.